Amen. Good morning. Let's get standing together as we sort our worship off with our call to worship this morning uh, comes to us, the book of Psalms, chapter 150, verses 1 and 2. So let's read that together. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellence, grace, greatness, grace also. This morning we worship him as exactly as this last part says, praise him according to his excellent greatness. And I can assure you that each one of you can attest to that excellent greatness, the grace, the love, and the power that we've seen come only from God. And so we sing together this morning in that worship, in that praise to a holy God who is worthy of those praises this morning. So we sing together. Let's see this first part. I look to the hills. Where does my help come from? From you alone, Lord. I look to the hills. Where does my help come from? From you alone. From you, you alone. You're reaching out for me. Cause you are my Savior, and you are the Lord Almighty. None can stand against your name, Lord, your name has the power to save, power to save. You are the Lord Almighty. There is nothing like your love, Lord, your love. You have given it all given it all. We come to the cross, and I come to the cross, and there I find all I need. Surrender my heart, Jesus draw near to me. For you are my Savior, and you are the Lord Almighty. None can stand against your name. Lord, your name has the power to save, power to save. You are the Lord Almighty. There is nothing like your love. Lord, your love, you have given it all. Giving it all. You are the one. You are the one I live for. You are the one that saves. You are the light that shines. You are the one I live for. You are the one that saves. You are the light that shines And you are the Lord Almighty None can stand against your name Lord, your name has the power to save Power to save you Are the Lord Almighty There is nothing like your love Lord, your love You have given it all Giving it all. Let's sing this chorus out. Who is like the Lord our God? And who is like the Lord? Our God is strong to save faithful in love. My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. The grace of God has reached for me. 
and pull me from the raging sea and I'm safe and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will not fear I will not fear when darkness falls his strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the dawn of the rising sun The Lord is my salvation Sing that chorus again Who is like, oh and who is like the Lord our God Is strong to save faithful in love, my dead is paid, and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. My hope is hidden in the Lord. He flowers each promise of His word. When winter fades, I know spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. Oh, and who is like the Lord? Our God is strong to save faithful. In love, my dead is paid. And the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. And glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. The Lord is our salvation see that again glory be and glory be to God the Father glory be to God the Son glory be to God the Spirit oh the Lord is our salvation Oh, and who is like the Lord, our God, is strong to save faithful. In love, my dead is paid, and the victory won. The Lord is our salvation. My dead is paid, and the victory the Lord is our salvation. Singing holy, holy, holy. And holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. valleys you are holy in our joys praise the one who came to rescue us praise the Godhead three in one and holy 
holy, holy, though the darkness hide thee, and though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, only thou art holy, and there is none beside thee, and perfect in power and love and purity. For you are holy in our valleys, you are holy in our joy. Praise the one who came to rescue us. Praise the Godhead three in one. And holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Thy works shall praise thy name in earth, in sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, and God in three persons. Blessed Trinity, you are holy in our valley, you are holy in our joy. Praise the one who came to rescue us, praise the Godhead three. One and praise the Godhead three in one. And how I love the voice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. He declares his work is finished. He has spoken this hope to me. And though the sun has ceased its shining, and though the war appears as lost, Christ had triumphed over evil. It was finished upon that cross. Now the curse, it has been broken. Jesus paid the price for me. And for the pardon he has offered, great the welcome that I receive. And boldly I approach my Father, clothed in Jesus' righteousness. And there is no more guilt to carry. It was finished upon that cross. And death was once my great opponent. Fear once had a hold on me. And but the Son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed and death was once my great opponent a fear once had a hold on me but the son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed yes he rose that we would be free indeed and free from every plan of darkness free to live and free to love 
death is dead and Christ is risen. It was finished upon that cross and onward to eternal glory to my Savior and my God. And I rejoice in Jesus' victory. It was finished upon that cross. And I rejoice in Jesus' victory. It was finished upon that cross. It was finished upon that cross. It was finished upon that cross. Lord, we thank you that it was finished on that cross, Lord. The salvation that we had through your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, and the love that was shown on that day, Lord. We thank you for that grace and that love and that mercy shown to us, Lord. Even though we did not deserve that, Lord, it was still shown to us. Lord, we praise your name this morning, only one worthy of our praises this morning, the honor and the glory to your name. It is in Jesus' name that we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As Lance was praying there, he said that we did not deserve that grace and mercy. And beyond that, we do not deserve this beautiful book that we have in our hands this morning. And so we uh, weekly aim to make it an act of worship to read um, Scripture. And so this morning we look to Genesis chapter 49, continuing through the book of Genesis, and we pick up in verse 28. It says, All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. So he blessed them. He blessed them, every one with the blessing appropriate to him. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham brought along with the field from Ephron and the Hittite as a possession for a burial site. And there they buried Abraham and his wife Sarah. There they buried Isaac and his wife Rebekah. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it purchased from the sons of Heth, And so Jacob finished commanding his sons, and he drew his feet into the bed, and he breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. We go to Psalm chapter 7. Titled, In You I Have Taken Refuge. O Yahweh my God, in you I have taken refuge. Save me from all those who pursue me, and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion. Rending me in pieces while there is none to deliver. O Yahweh, my God, if I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands, if I have rewarded evil to him who is at peace with me, or have plundered my adversary without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life down to the, to the ground and cause my glory to dwell in the dust. Arise, O Yahweh, in your anger. Lift up yourself against the fury of my adversaries and arouse yourself for me. You have appointed judgment. Let the congregation of the peoples encompass you and over them return on high. Yahweh judges the peoples. Give justice to me, O Yahweh, according to my righteousness and my integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous, God tests the hearts and the minds. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, and God has indignation every day. If a man does not repent, he he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and prepared it. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, he travails with wickedness and conceives mischief. And gives birth to falsehood. He has dug a pit and hollowed it out and has fallen into the hole which he made. His mischief will return upon his own head and his violence will descend upon his own skull. I will give thanks to Yahweh according to his righteousness and I will sing praise to the name of Yahweh most high. 
As we prepare our hearts for the sermon, I want to invite Mr. Chad Thompson to come uh, deliver that. But uh, I do want to say, uh, if you know Chad Thompson, he's one of our own. Uh, he is one of the most uh, genuine in heart, uh, kindest men I've ever met. It's always a pleasure to be around him. So, Mr. Chad. Well, good morning. And I'll be honest, I'm a little nervous, so y'all, y'all help me. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be able to study the holy and inerrant Word of God with you this morning. My name is Chad Thompson. I serve as a deacon here at First Baptist Church, Opelousas. And I'm a, I'm a nurse by trade. For the past 30 years, I've been a nurse. I mention my profession because I care for the physically sick in the critical care setting. I work with surgeons who spend years of their lives in training so that they can perform complicated heart surgeries to repair diseased blood vessels of the heart. But think about this. All of those years of training done by a physician to do these complicated surgeries and all this experience and expertise does no good to the patient if the patient does not realize that they're sick and that they need a doctor. A surgeon can do no good to a sick patient if the patient is not in the presence of the surgeon. And a patient will not seek out a surgeon unless he or she realizes that they're sick. Well, thankfully, only a small percentage of our population has pathological heart disease that requires heart surgery on any given day. But we all, each and every one of us, has spiritual heart disease in common with one another. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 says, Thus says Yahweh, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from Yahweh. And in verse 9, he goes on to say, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can know it? I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the inmost being, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. In Luke chapter 5, verse 31 and 32, Jesus, when confronting the Pharisees, who were questioning why Jesus was mingling with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus answered them by saying, it's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The goal of my message this morning is to remind you and me that we are all, by nature, spiritually sick. We may not all have diseased heart blood vessels, but we have all sinned, and we're all going to sin again. And because of our sins, our hearts are hard and we're spiritually dead, unable to stand in the presence of a holy and righteous God. And we all need some heart healing to take place. Apart from the grace given to us through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for the payment of our sins, we are all spiritually sick, spiritually dead, and we have to realize it. We are sinners separated from God in dire need of salvation. So this morning, I'm going to share the healing gospel of Jesus Christ with you so that you may live. The gospel that brings sinners from spiritual death to spiritual life. So our main text this morning will be Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 20. But I have a lot of scriptures mingled in through this message, so, so I'll read, the, I'll read the, the verses slowly and the, uh, the, the, uh, the chapters slowly so that you can follow along in your Bible if you want to. So Mark 5, verse 1 through 20. In this passage, we'll see a man who's filled with evil spirits that control him. So if you will, Mark 5, verses 1 through 20. I'll read that for us. Then they came to the other side of the sea, into the region of the Gerasenes. 
And when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met with him, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn away by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. And constantly, night and day, among the tombs and in the mountains, he was crying out and gashing himself with stones. And seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. Crying out with a loud voice, he said, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he was pleading with him earnestly not to send them out of the region. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. And the demons pleaded with him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. And their herdsmen ran away, reported it in the city and in the countryside, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and observed the demon-possessed man sitting down, clothed in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. And those who'd seen it recounted to them how this had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to plead with him to leave their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was pleading with him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to preach in the Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, and everything, everyone was marveling. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, as we study your holy word today, please allow us to understand your word as you intend it to be understood. Please allow us to rightly understand your holiness and give you the proper respect and worship that you deserve today. Please open our eyes and hearts that we may rightly understand our need for salvation because of our sins. Let us rejoice in what Christ has done for us on the cross, taking on the punishment that we deserve for our sins so that we can have a right relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we study this passage this morning, I want us to focus on the man mentioned in the passage. He was as spiritually sick as a human could be. He was filled with unclean spirits, filled with evil. He was separated, living among the dead in the graveyard. It was clear to all those around him that he was filled with evil. He was helpless and unable to save himself from his miserable condition. And those living in the community with him they could not save him either from his miserable condition. But here I am to say to you this morning that this man was in a better position than some of us who are here today. He knew he was spiritually sick, and everyone around him knew that he was spiritually sick. There was no hidden or undiagnosed spiritual disease in this man. And as we study this passage this morning, I want to stress three main points that we are spiritually sick because of our sin, that we are separated from God because of our sin, and that only Jesus Christ can save us from our sins. So in our passage this morning, Jesus had been going through Galilee, training his disciples, teaching large crowds, performing miraculous healings, and having confrontations with the Pharisees, who were the self-righteous religious leaders of the time. So Jesus, along with, with his disciples, decided to cross the Sea of Galilee to go to the region of the Gerasenes, which is 
to a village just across the shore on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. On the trip across the sea in Mark chapter 4, Jesus performed the miracle of calming the, the sea. And it left his disciples wondering, who is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. So our passage of focus this morning, Mark 5, starts when they make it across the sea to the shore on the other side. And they're immediately approached by a man. In verse 1 and 2 of our text, it states that this man was filled with an unclean spirit. And verse 3 through 5 gives us a picture of how this unclean spirit was controlling this man's life. He was living among the tombs, breaking out of restraints with superhuman strength, running around day and night screaming and cutting himself with stones. This text paints a vivid picture of what a man filled with evil looks like. He was out of control. Nothing was hidden here. His spiritual condition was an open book. He was spiritually sick. And it must have been scary for this man to be in such a situation, unable to control his thoughts and actions while these evil forces were controlling him. He was running around doing things to harm himself and possibly others without seemingly having the power within himself to stop acting that way. And I'm sure it was very unpleasant for those around him to witness these actions and deal with the consequences of this man's behavior. But I'll bet it's safe to say that we're glad that we don't have to deal with this evil demon-possessed man described in the passage, and that we hope we'll never have to meet anyone like him. And it's probably also safe to say that we're glad that we did not have to experience this man's inner battle with those evil forces. But I hate to break the news to you. Unfortunately, for all of us, as we read in Jeremiah earlier, the heart is deceitful and desperately sick, and we all have a heart. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, the good teacher states in verse 3, it's Ecclesiastes 9 verse 3, it says, This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one fate for all. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. And in Mark chapter 7, verse 14 through 23, when Jesus was responding to the Pharisees who were calling him out in front of the crowd because one of his disciples ate bread without washing his hands, Jesus responded with these statements. And after he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. And if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples were asking him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you lacking understanding in this way as well? Do you not perceive that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him, because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and goes into the sewer. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, That which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. This passage makes it very clear. Our hearts within each and every one of us are sinful, and our sin proceeds from our hearts. And in our sinful state, we all have spiritual heart disease. So here's a question. How did this sin get into our hearts to make them spiritually sick? Well, Romans chapter 5, verse 12 tells us, 
Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because of all sin. That one man through whom sin entered into the world was Adam. In Genesis chapter 3, the account is given where Adam and Eve chose to disobey God and eat of the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, committing the first sin and bringing death into the world. This act of disobedience was spurred on by the father of lies, the evil serpent, Satan, the devil. Well, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12 tells us that we should put on the full armor of God to protect us against the schemes of the devil. Because our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of the wickedness in the heavenly places. Our natural state of having spiritually sick hearts, beating within us, pumping out sins, are not all that much different than the poor man in our passage. He was being controlled by the evil spiritual forces living within him. We're all fighting a spiritual battle within ourselves, and we have to always remember this. So to summarize, all natural men have hearts, sinful behaviors and thoughts come from the heart, and as Romans 3.23 plainly tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all spiritually sick because of our sins. So another question, what are the consequences of our spiritually sick hearts and the sin that pumps out from them? We all fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, in our sinful state, we're separated from God. We all fall short of the glory of God. So therefore, in our sinful state, we're separated from God. So let's remember from our text, the man filled with the evil spirits of Legion. He had to live among the tombs, apart from the members of his community. He couldn't live in town because he couldn't control the evil within him. He couldn't live in society because he just didn't fit in. As sinners, because of our sins, we don't fit in with the holy and perfect God. We see this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. Therefore, Yahweh God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden that God had personally planted for them to live in. The garden that God had assigned Adam to watch over and keep. The garden where God could fellowship with them because of their sins. God cast them out. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God And God is a holy God. He's a just God. And sinners cannot enter into his presence. Just as the man possessed with the evil spirits could not live among his peers in the village because of the evil within him, sinners are not allowed to enter into the presence of God because of the sin within them. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2 says, Behold, the hand of Yahweh is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. In Ephesians 4, verse 17 and 18, Paul tells us not to act like the Gentiles, who represent those apart from God in this passage. Therefore, this I say and testify in the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their mind, alienated from the life of God, 
because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. We have to understand this clearly. Our spiritually sick and sinful hearts separate us from God. Our sins, and we're all sinners, separate us from a holy God. The meaning of the word holy is set apart. When Adam and Eve sinned, God could not be in their presence any longer. Because of the fall of Adam and Eve, we have inherited their sinful nature. And this puts us in an unholy state. The demon-possessed man was clearly not like those living among him. He was running around, screaming all night, slashing himself with stones because of the evil influence within him. When we sin, we are clearly not like God. And in our sinful state, we are living set apart from a holy and sinless God, unable to dwell in his presence. So remember when I said earlier that the man possessed by legion may be in a better position than some of us here today? This is what I mean. We're all dealing with, with our evil and sinful natures, but we are all not running around screaming and cutting ourselves with rocks for all to see. For most of us, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, the sins we struggle with are kept hidden from sight. In some cases, we are the only ones who know that they exist. And in some cases, the sin's been there so long that we don't even notice them any longer. It's spiritual life and death for us to realize that the quiet and hidden sins are more dangerous than the loud and boisterous sins. Sin is sin, but at least the townspeople tried to tie up the man to help control him. They tried to attend to him. They could see he was struggling with evil. They could not save him from the evil that controlled him, but they saw a need and they tried to restrain him. Hidden sins are not obvious to others, so if you keep them hidden from others, you don't get help offered to you. So I know that we have at some point in our lives all struggled with hidden sin. You may be presently struggling with hidden sins today. However, we must know that hidden sins are not actually hidden. 1 Samuel 16, 7 reads, But Yahweh said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks at the heart. In this passage, Samuel thought David's brother Eliab looked the part of the next king to be anointed, but God had other plans. God does not look upon man as man looks upon man. God looks at the heart. It was obvious that the man possessed by legion did not have it all together. But for those of us who look like we're doing just fine on the outside, God looks at the heart. For those of us who look good on the outside, but are covering up the ugliness on the inside, God looks at the heart. The townspeople in our passage who tried to restrain the crazed man, even though they were not possessed with thousands of evil spirits, they had their own sins to deal with. It's important for us to realize that God compares our own personal sins to his holiness, and we all fall short of the glory of God. So we cannot fall into the trap of comparing our sins to the sins of other sinful people around us. It's easy for us to say, I'm not perfect, but I'm not running around screaming all night, and I'm not slashing myself with rocks, acting like a madman for all to see. I have my troubles, but I'm not as bad as that person or those people. When we compare our sins to the holiness of God, or we must compare our sins to the holiness of God and not to one another to fully understand how much we fall short. 
Psalms 90 verse 8 tells us, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Our sins, all of our sins, the secret ones and the non-secret ones are not hidden from God. And they separate us from God and they condemn us to an eternity apart from Him and to an eternity of torment in hell. But Jesus came to save us. Jesus came to save us. That's the good news of the gospel. The evil spirits within the man in our passage knew that Jesus had the power to cast them out and that Jesus had the power to torment them if he chose to. In Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 6, we see that the man knelt down before Jesus. And in verse 7, he states, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. The unclean spirits knew that Jesus had power over them. They knew Jesus was the Son of the Most High God. In verse 8, we see where Jesus began to command the unclean spirits to come out of the man. And in verse 9 through 13, Jesus gave the demons permission to enter a herd of swine. And then the swine rushed down the steep banks into the sea to be drowned. Just as Jesus cast these demons out of the man into the sea, Scripture tells us that Jesus can cast out our sins. He can heal our spiritually sick hearts. He can give us a heart transplant. In Ezekiel chapter 36, starting in verse 25, God commands Ezekiel to tell Israel the following. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanliness and from your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, Moses tells the Israelites, Moreover, Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. So back to our passage in Mark, verse 14. It tells us that the men of the town saw these pigs running down the side of the cliff into the sea, and they ran and told everyone what had happened, and people came to see for themselves what took place. In verse 15, when they came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting there, dressed in his right mind, they were afraid. They begged Jesus to leave. They saw the power that Jesus had over these demons and how he had restored the man back to his right mind. And the townspeople could not make sense of it. They were afraid of Jesus and they asked him to leave. In verse 16 through 18, as Jesus was leaving, the man who had been demon possessed wanted to go with Jesus, but Jesus does not allow it. In verse 19, Jesus tells the man, go home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he has mercy on you. And in verse 20, he tells the man to go out, proclaim how much Jesus had done for him, and he did, and all were amazed. This man was saved from his evil, demon-possessed state because Jesus had mercy on him. Not because of anything that this helpless man had done on his own, but because Jesus had mercy on him. He went from running around like a madman, filled with evil, to a man restored. A man who can now sit at the feet of Jesus. A man who now has a powerful testimony to share with others about the mercy of Jesus and the power of Jesus to change his life. He has the same mercy for us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 tells us about Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, 
so that having died to sin, we might live to righteousness. By his wounds, you were healed. And 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 tells us that he, God, made him, talking about Jesus, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As sinners, as, as we have talked about today, we cannot have a right relationship with God. God is a just God, and our sins deserve punishment. God punished his son, Jesus, who had no sin, who was holy, exactly as his father God in heaven is holy. God punished his son, Jesus, on the cross by placing our sins upon him and allowing Jesus to die with our sins upon him. Just as Jesus cast the evil spirits into the swine and they ran down the cliff to be buried in the sea, because of his love for us, not because of anything that we've done to deserve it, Jesus took our sins upon himself and he took them to the cross where they were removed from us forever. On the third day after Jesus' death, he rose again from the grave to prove that he was the Son of God and that he had power over death. And he ascended into heaven after instructing his disciples to spread his gospel, to make disciples throughout the nations. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to dwell inside those he calls to him, to change our hard hearts, to want a flesh, and to fill those new hearts of those he saves with the Spirit of God. Jesus received our punishment so that we could be restored to a right relationship with God and have fellowship with him. Just like the man in our passage today, because of the mercy of Jesus, we can throw our rocks down. We can stop running around, letting sin control and direct our lives. We can sit at his feet in our right minds, minds that no longer crave the ways of sinful flesh, but the ways of our holy God. We must realize that we are sinners. We must be saved from our sins by Jesus Christ so that we may have a right relationship with him. We cannot save ourselves because we are stained with sin. No other man or woman can save us because they are stained with sin. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. We have to admit that we're all sinners and believe that Jesus died for our sins and put our faith in him as our Lord and Savior and repent to turn away from our sins. A new heart is required for this to happen. A miraculous spiritual heart transplant that has to take place. This happens by hearing and believing in the healing gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, today you've heard the gospel. I pray for the Holy Spirit to do his work today, changing hard hearts, to soft hearts so that we can put aside our sinful desires which we're all guilty of so that we can be restored to a right relationship with God so I'll close this out today with this passage John chapter 3 verse 14 through 21 Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus a Pharisee how someone must be born again of the water and the spirit before they can enter the kingdom of God. So starting in verse 14, John 3. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, 
but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been done by God. So bow your heads with me and, and I'll close this in prayer.